The assignment that's up is the one there. We'll, we'll talk about it. You're asking about the assignment from for the practice test? Yeah. Yeah, I just didn't bother changing the practice test from last year. All right. I'm happy to see everybody again. We have one more lecture of new material and then we're done. I'm really more like one and a half. We probably will will finish up like three slides worth and some practice of new material on Wednesday. And then other than that, Wednesday's review. So this is your last real lecture. Um, so let's look at this week real quick. Uh, I apologize, or I um, thank everybody for their understanding last week. I hope it went well. Um, got lots of practice with stoichiometry with those. So hopefully, I just graded the previous week's quiz, which was your first stoichiometry quiz. I uh, graded that this morning. Um, so hopefully, after last week, everybody's feeling a little bit more confident than they were two weeks ago on stoichiometry. Um, but we'll still keep doing more practice with it because it applies to all of our acid base reactions um, and all of our new stuff as well. So we'll keep using the stoichiometry, talking about limiting reactant and things like that. Um, so you'll get more practice as well. Um, all right, so your last, your last two assignments before the final exam, which does have two take home problems on it. Um, that will be available starting on Thursday, Wednesday. This is a Monday, Wednesday class. On Wednesday, um, so you will have those take home problems. It's just two word problems. Um, they're not super tricky problems. They're just have a little bit of problem solving. So I want you to um, be able to use resources, work together, look at similar problems, stuff like that. Everything short of putting it on Chegg. Um, and uh, the other two assignments are practice test, which says 2020, but that's just because I didn't change the file. Oh, it's because I'm in student view. Uh, yeah, you should have the, there it is. Um, so just to give you a brief overview, if it will actually load. All right, well, I will figure out what's going on with that. I know some of you were able to open it, so it's not, it must just be an issue with this computer, right? Um, and either way, I can open it this way. Uh, so what I wanted to say about this practice test is Essentially, none of the formatting is going to change. There's not going to be any surprises on the type of questions I'm asking. There's going to be, um, since this one is a closed book, um, final rather than last year, the one we were on, on uh, Zoom, it was an open book final. So I made the questions a little bit harder on the practice test. Your in-class test, what will, the biggest difference will be these won't be short short answer questions, it'll be more like vocab. Just explain general concepts like what is density? Um, what is uncertainty? Things like that. Um, uh, num and there's gonna be, you know, 10% of it is just do this algebra, what happens to the units, what happens to the sig figs? 
right? So sig figs are still coming back. Um, there's a nomenclature one, count protons, neutrons, and electrons, and give me the electron configuration. The key will be available on Thursday. I think I have it set up to go on Thursday. Simple conversions. So, and it's gonna be four of them, and they're gonna be set up like, um, there's going to be a long distance conversion. So where you have, to, it's gonna take you like four or five steps to do it. And I want you to only use the um, conversions that are on the, on the conversion sheet. So basically I'm, I want you to show me you can do multiple steps in a row is what I'm asking with this first one. That's why I'm making you do a long but easy conversion. And then there'll be a temperature conversion. There's gonna be something that involves higher powers, either areas or volumes, like we practiced a long time ago. Then there's gonna be one that has combined units, like maybe grams per cubic centimeter going to pounds per gallon, for instance, um, would be something that you could do. That's one of these combined units. Speeds, converting from one speed to another speed. Um, but they're gonna be set up in the exact same way, right? So no surprises. It's gonna be a little intimidating when I hand it out because it's gonna be 10 pages plus your equation sheet and your and a periodic table at the end, all single-sided. So you have plenty of blank paper to write on the back of if you want it. I'm just, I purposely provide lots of paper, not so that it seems like a book that you have to finish, but just so that there's lots of empty space. Right, so it's not trying to cram everything into a tiny space. Uh, Lewis dot structures, molecular geometries, polarity, whether it's a polar molecule or not. So that probably has to do some review because that's been a bit now, right? It's been a minute. Um, and then just into stoichiometry and tell me what type of reaction it is. Balance it. How much product can you make? What's the limiting reactant? Those type of questions. That's the rest of the test, seven, eight, and nine are straight up stoichiometry. And then 10 is always just a wild card. It can be a little bit of problem solving. It's gonna be involved with conversion to some extent. I'm gonna give you some conversions in the word problem. Um, and just before you get intimidated by that, if you are really bad at word problems and you really don't even wanna to attempt to this one, you can still get a 90% without even touching this one, right? And if you look at this one and say, well, I don't have time to do the math because I'm running out of time, but here's the general idea. I think that I would go this way. You write out your roadmap um, just with arrows and units. You get five out of 10 just for doing that if you have it planned out properly. Right? This problem is to basically is to separate A's from B's. If you want to get above a 90%, you've got to at least attempt wildcard problem and you've got to you know, show me you have at least a plan. If you're happy with a B, just do one through nine. Get all your easy points. Don't make too many sig fig mistakes. You can get a, a solid B without even touching number 10. But if you want an A on the final, you've got to do number 10, at least try it, right? That's really what it's there for. It's, that's, I know it's a tricky problem, but that's the whole point. Other than that, these are all going to be really predictable problems. So do the practice test, get comfortable with one through nine at least. And um, we'll go through any of these problems that you want to talk about that you want to work through them as a group on Wednesday. Right. And the other assignment that I made the assignment file, but didn't put the link in the week overview yet is uh, your last lab, which is today or Wednesday. Just one more lab write up. Um, go in, measure some numbers, do some stoichiometry, um, and uh, that'll be that. Yeah, there it is, lab 11, titration. All right, so I'll have copies as usual for this lab. Uh, any questions about the next two weeks, scheduling-wise, planning things out? Yeah, dear? I believe it's Wednesday. Let me check the syllabus. It's on the syllabus. I think we're offset by an hour from our normal time. And this is a good thing to pay attention to. I believe our final exam is noon to two. 
And I think it's Wednesday, but let me double check the schedule. So yeah, so it's in this room from noon to two, a week from Wednesday. Uh, any other questions scheduling wise? I know I've been really bad. This was probably been one of my worst quarters in terms of staying on top of grading for you guys and getting your, your labs back. Um, I'm working on that. Last week was going to be my big push, except that I wasn't able to you know, sit upright for most of it. Um, so I'm trying to get caught up on those. Your quiz grades shouldn't really change though, right? Because everybody has all your quiz grades are in there. And whatever you've been getting on your labs, as long as you've turned everything in, you can count on that being about the same in the, uh, that assignment category. If you fell off since, since week six and have not are missing three assignments in that category, you might see that category take a dip in terms of grades. But other than that, whatever you've been getting on your labs should be about the same as what you'll see moving forward. So don't, don't be uh, too worried about that. And I'll try to have the, all of those finalized. Um, if not by the end of the day on Friday, then the end of the day on Monday. All right, so you'll, before you take the final, you'll know everything except for your final exam grade. Uh, any other procedural scheduling questions? Yeah. You get to drop one assignment in the assignments category. And the assignments category for this class is basically anything that's not a quiz goes into assignments. Okay. So if you've turned in everything and you've got nines and tens on, on all of it, are you happy with your grade um, and you don't want to come to lab this week or you didn't want to do the paper assignment from last week, you know, you're at a point now where you can do that. Um, if you missed a week earlier because you got sick or had something else come up and you got a five out of 10 sitting there for doing the write-up, you probably want that to be your drop. So you probably don't want to skip this last, these last two assignments if you can avoid it. Um, and I believe all of the uh, the what if or the hypotheticals that Canvas has for if you go in and look and you can fill in grades for stuff. If you put in a couple zeros for assignments you don't want to finish, see what it does to your grade. Um, it takes into account all the categories and everything that I have programmed in. So that'll give you an idea of what you need to do. Or you can do a weighted average. If you know what the different categories are and what they're weighted, you can figure out what you need to get in each category to get an A in the class. We didn't have fancy what if tools on online grades and stuff like that. We had to keep track of our grades by hand when I was in school, back in my day. <laughs> um, all right, so some relevant quiz questions. Some of these may have gotten answered last week. Um, how do we know how to label different types of reactions? It's one of those things where the more you practice with it, the easier it'll be. It's like gaining fluency in another language, right? You might really stumble over how to conjugate a star for the first several years you're taking Spanish. And then, you know, eventually gets to the point where you barely need to think about it. Oh, that's obviously an acid base reaction because it is. Um, but uh, it does take practice. Look at those, at those clues, you know, find the easy ones first. The way that I always go about these is eliminate the ones that's easiest to tell. You can look at it and say, well, I know it's obviously not a combustion reaction because it doesn't make CO2 and water. Boom. There's one of my five choices knocked off right away. Um, you can look at it. It's obviously not a precipitation reaction. Then you can knock that one off as well. Right? So look for things like that. That's, that's probably the easiest thing to do is use process of elimination. Um, if you burn wood, and you have charred wood left over, is that excess reactants? Yeah. Um, sometimes it, it'll stop burning. Like if you put out a fire and you still have like, you know, blackened charcoal still left over, that would still burn if you got it hot enough again. So that's not really that you ran out of oxygen and therefore you have leftover wood. 
It's more like if you get below a certain oxygen level, the reaction slows down, gets colder, and eventually gets to the point where it can't keep the reaction going because it needs to have a certain amount of heat to start the reaction. Um, but yeah, that's excess reactant. And so you can actually do a theoretical yield um, for burning firewood. You can even do calorimetry with it. Say, okay, how many logs do I need to burn to boil this much water, for instance? Um, this is just a good excuse to talk about poison in general. Anybody heard the, um, the phrase, make sure I get it right. The poison is in the dose. Basically everything's poisonous at the right dose. Water is poisonous at the right dose, right? And a lot of the stuff on the periodic table is just point blank toxic in any dose, but some of it's only poisonous at certain levels. Copper is necessary to live. Your, some of your enzymes use copper, but if you have copper ions above a certain threshold in your drinking water, they become neurotoxic and they accumulate in your brain. It's a lot like having mercury poisoning. So there's a lot of things on the periodic table there that are poisonous above a certain point. So chemistry is really an ex exercise in uh, everything in moderation. <laughs> Organic mercury is probably this lethal in the smallest doses. Um, there was um, a researcher who worked with organic mercury. So mercuries that are have mercury ions that have uh, covalent bonds with carbons. Um, and they go right through your cell membranes a lot easier than metallic mercury does. Um, so there was a researcher working with some of these who got like one drop of, of organic mercury on her wrist above her glove. Um, and she was dead in two weeks. Uh, just nothing they could do about it. They didn't even realize. Um, and even once they realized there was not really anything they could do because that particular combination of mercury and carbon is that poisonous. But in general, mercury is not even that bad, as bad a rap as it gets. Um, people, alchemists used to eat mercury, metallic mercury, because they thought it would purify their digestive system, they would literally eat liquid mercury and make their poop sparkly. Um, they thought that that was cleaning themselves out and it probably was, it also killed them slowly. Um, let's see, how does stoichiometry apply to the real world? Anytime you got stuff getting used up, Anytime you're using a recipe, that's stoichiometry really, right? Even if it's not a chemical reaction, you can balance it. You can write it like a chemical reaction, which means you can use these same things to figure out, am I gonna run out of onions or avocado first if I'm making guacamole? You know, things like that, ordering for restaurants, dosing in terms of uh, filling prescriptions. All these things are, are places where you can use the same concepts, even if it's not chemistry, you can make, you can treat it like chemistry and it's just a conversion problem there. All right, these two are actually relevant. Um, are there some steps you need to do first in these stoichiometry problems to make the other steps easier or can you do them out of order? Once you have a balanced chemical reaction, and you know what your limiting reactant is, any other questions can be answered in any order. Like you don't have to find excess reactant before you find theoretical yield, right? They can be done in any order at that point. Um, so there's not necessarily one order that you have to go in to answer all these questions. You don't need to answer all these questions all the time. If I go back to the uh, practice test, The first stoichiometry problem is a really, really simple stoichiometry problem. Everything's already in moles. All you've got to do is balance it and figure out what runs out first in order to get your theoretical yield. This problem doesn't even ask for excess reactant. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to find the excess reactant. You could, that's not what the question's asking. All right, so a lot of it is just read the question, see what steps are needed to figure things out. It's a, it's a more of a logic puzzle than it is 
memorize these steps and go in order, right? You have to stop and think about the question you're trying to answer rather than just do a checklist, which checklists are comforting. I get that. It's a lot easier to memorize a procedure sometimes than it is to think hard about a problem. <clears throat> but that's the trickiest part of this class is trying to organize your thoughts and plan it out yourself. Right. And I'm going to ask you a really simple one before I ask you anything where it's with grams to moles. Um, so, and they, they get gradually more complicated as, as the uh, test goes on, right? So when in doubt, just go as far as you can, answer the question you can, then move on. Let me at least give you some, pre some um, partial credit, right? And even in this one, if you struggle with stoichiometry, I'm grading this, I think probably three points out of 10 is gonna be balancing the reaction. Two points is telling, giving me the right reaction type and five points is answering the question in terms of theoretical yield, right? So there's a lot of easy points to be gotten on these two, because I think everybody can balance reactions at this point, especially if I write the reaction for you, right? So don't pass up the easy points. Um, when calculating theoretical yield where the product side reaction is not given to you, can you pick any or either of the react of the products? If I just say, what's the theoretical yield of this reaction? I don't say of what, then yeah, you kind of just, I guess, pick one. In general, it'll be, what's the theoretical yield of tin? What's the theoretical yield of solid, of carbon dioxide, of something? So that way, that kind of takes away the, the choice there. It's, it's supposed to be very specific because you're going to have a different theory for a combustion reaction where you make CO2 and water. You're going to have a different theoretical yield of CO2 than your theoretical yield of water, right? Because you're making different amounts of the two of them, right? So I have to tell you theoretical yield of what? And again, on the, the test, that's going to be um, written in this format. So I'm, I'm asking you the theoretical yield in moles of silver chloride. Doesn't matter how much calcium nitrate we make. That's not what the question's asking. You could calculate it, but you don't need to. Yeah? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think I'm recording. Yep. I thought you said, are you going? And then stopped. <laughs> going to what? Um, all right. So how are we feeling about basic stoichiometry? How'd last week's classes go? That assignment? All right. Feel, feeling at least like you have a handle on what the steps and the logic is, even if you, you messed up here and there. Okay. Um, no, I didn't grab the rest of the problem there. Uh, should we go through that the uh, problem from quiz nine from two weeks ago? That can be way too easy at this point. You're past that. Should probably work through it just for practice, right? All right, so that was I missed this part. All right, for the reaction of 25.0 grams of tin two chloride, reacting with 3.400 grams of aluminum metal. Write out, balance the reaction, determining limit reactant, calculate amount of excess reactant in grams, calculate theoretical yield of tin metal in grams. And so if you already have this, you got full credit, you can still work through this, go through the steps, just like you haven't already done this problem or otherwise follow along and try and see where you went wrong if you, if you ran into issues. For starters, it starts as a bit of a nomenclature problem, right? You have to know how to write this out.
So tin two chloride, what's the two re referring to? The charge on the tin, right? So if tin has a plus two charge, chloride's got what, what charge? Negative one. So it takes two chlorides for every one tin. Writing the formula for anything, any metal is easy. Just write it in its elemental state. Aluminum metal is just Al. And it's forming tin metal and aluminum chloride. So this one, you might have to look at your periodic table, remind yourself aluminum always has the same charge, which is why it doesn't have a um, uh, Roman numeral there. Al aluminum is always what? Plus three. So it takes three chlorides to balance the charge on the aluminum ion. If I don't give you a phase, like solid, liquid, gas, aqueous, just leave it off. It doesn't really matter for this. We're just trying to answer these questions. I'm not trying to be nitpicky about the phase on this one. If we want to determine the limiting reactant, then now we have to take the 25 grams and the three point, <coughs> excuse me. Three point four zero zero grams. Turn them into. Oh, we have to balance first, right? <coughs> we have an odd number of chlorides on one side and an even number on the other. That tells us we have to do something, right? What do we have to do right off the bat? We know we have to have a certain number of aluminum chlorides, right? We have to have two of them, that's the only way we can get to an even number of chlorides. Once we know we have two aluminum chlorides, that means we have to have three tin two chlorides, get to a total of six chlorides, and then we can just bounce the, uh, the metals. Right, saving those metals for the end, since we can change them without changing anything else is gonna make our life easier. Balance the trickiest things first, usually. And then anytime we're doing a stoichiometry problem, especially a theoretical yield, we're trying to get <coughs> grams. You start by putting everything in moles. And if we're given masses, we want to put it in moles, we just use molecular weight. So for the metals, that's easy. We just use the molecular weight on the periodic table. I'm not sure why, but several people use 50 something as the molecular weight for aluminum, but it's smaller than that. it's like 27. It's not 50 something. So I'm not sure if that got, if that was doubled because there's a two in front of it, maybe. Remember the coefficients don't affect the molecular weight, right? Because the molecular weight is based on the formula, not how fast they're being used up, right? So your molecular weight for aluminum is just what's on the periodic table. Your molecular weight for the tin two chloride is two chlorines and one tin. Despite the coefficient of three, that tells you how fast they're getting used up, not how much each piece weighs. Right, go back to our car analogy. Just because you're using four doors per car doesn't change the weight of a door. So when we want to put these in um, moles, I think this winds up being 188. 189. We do want at least four sig figs because our measured mass to begin with has four sig figs. So we want our molecular weight to have four sig figs so we don't have to round off just because we're too lazy to get out a calculator. Um, so what's one more sig fig? 
five, six. If you want to carry more, that's fine. You just need at least four because we don't want our final answer to be rounded off due to the molecular weight unless we can't help it, right? We always want to, this number is hard. <clears throat> is harder to measure accurately. So don't let the laziness of not wanting to go get a more accurate periodic table or something limit you on how many sig figs you get to keep at the end. I think it winds up being 0 0.13, thank you. We do the same thing with the aluminum. And then just use the molecular weight of aluminum by itself, which technically is atomic mass, not molecular weight, because it's not a compound, but I use the terms interchangeably. So because they work the same way. And you get 0 0.1263. Six, zero. All right, is that enough to tell limiting reactant? No, because just because we have fewer moles of aluminum doesn't mean anything because we're not using them up at the same rate. Because they have different coefficients in front of them, we're using up three tin two chlorides for every two aluminums. So we need to show which one's gonna run out first. And there are a couple ways to do that. I actually learned a new way of showing that from grading y'all's work um, that we'll talk about in a second because it, it's a good tool to have. Um, and I wanna talk about the logic behind it. But the way that we've been working on these is just say, okay, well, pick one of these and see how much product you can get or see how much of the other one it, was, it would use. So if we say, okay, 0.1318, moles of tin two chloride and every time three moles is used two moles of aluminum are used so this is saying if i used all of my tin two chloride how much aluminum would i use there's only three possible outcomes Either using all of my tin two chloride uses up the exact same amount of aluminum as I have, which would, in that case, there is no excess reactant. Everything's getting used up perfectly. I'm running out of avocados at the exact same point I'm running out of onion. Or one of, you're going to get a bigger number than what you actually have, or a smaller number than you actually have. So you just compare that and think about the logic of what that means. So in this case, we get 0 0.8, 0 0.08, something. Who has their work? I know it's like two weeks ago now, so it's been a bit. How many moles we get? What's two thirds times 0.138? Eight seven eight six. So eight seven yeah. It wouldn't because, and that's why I paused for a second because I was trying to say this. Four sig figs. Any minute sig figs. You keep four figs. That's not sig figs. Leaving zeros aren't sig figs. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Say it. Say it again. <laughs> and we had point one two something six three six zero so 
So if we have 0 0.1260 moles of aluminum and using up all of our tin two chloride, you only use as 0 0.08 moles of aluminum, that's less than what we actually have. Using up all of our engines mean we still have leftover doors. We didn't use up all the doors we have. So that tells us two things. One, this is gonna be useful in figuring out our excess reactant. But two, it also just tells us what runs out first, right? So that tells us tin two chloride is the limiting reactant. Right, so if we want to know excess reactant, <coughs> we just take what we started with and subtract, subtract what we used, and then put it in grams, because the problem specifically said in grams. If it didn't say in grams, leaving it in moles of excess reactant is a perfectly fine answer. Usually I'm going to specify a unit on it. All right, so it winds up being 0 0.03 something, right? And now we're only going to write to the 10,000th place. So something 191. Eight one. Borrowing in your head is hard. And if we want that in grams, we just use molecular weight again. Michaela? Um, could you explain one more time how you figured out the limiting reaction? But it was So when we said, when we used up all, <clears throat> 0 0.013, tell those numbers one more time. Moles into chloride. We said, okay, let's say we're gonna use all of that up. And every time we use three moles, uses two moles of the aluminum. And that gave us the 0.08 number, right? Well, if I actually have, point one two six zero moles and using up all of my tin two chloride, only uses a point oh eight moles. That means I'm gonna have leftover aluminum. So that tells you both what the excess reactant is and what's running out first at the same time. If you happen to pick the other one, if you said, okay, I have I've got I've got fewer moles of aluminum, therefore I think it's my limiting reactant, but I still want to show that. You can say, okay, well, every time I use two moles of aluminum, that's three moles of tin two chloride used. And you get something like 0.18 if you do that. That's more tin chloride than what we have, right? So you can find out your limiting reactant Either way, you just have to think, okay, if this says I use up 0.08 moles of aluminum and I have more than that, I have excess aluminum. If you do the math and says, okay, this says I'm gonna use up point, um, 0.18 moles of tin two chloride and I only have 0.13, I can't do that, right? I can't use um, the tin chloride that I don't have. 
So that would also tell you what the limiting reactant is. And I think once you do the math to get the <clears throat> excess reactant in grams, you get one, like 1 1.1, 1 1.06 or something like that. Once you know what the limiting reactant is, that's the amount that's gonna drive everything else, right? Because that's, that's what's limiting. That's what's controlling how much product you can make, how much of the other reactant you're using. Everything depends on your limiting reactant once you identify it. So once you identify your limiting reactant, that's gonna be your baseline. That's how many times this reaction can happen. So if we wanna find out how many grams of product we can make, it doesn't matter that we have 0.12 moles of aluminum. It just means it just matters that it's not running out. So we just use the limiting reactant here. And we can say three moles tin two chloride. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oops, sorry, three moles of tin. So it doesn't change number of moles, but we want it in grams. So then we can just take that and say one mole of tin is, is that 118. All right, so if you start with 0 0.1318 moles of tin two chloride, every three moles of tin two chloride makes three moles of tin metal. So that just cancels out one to one. We get the same number of moles of product that we started with. Then we just need to use the molecular, the new molecular weight, the molecular weight of the product to multiply and we get something like 15.6. 15.67, maybe. Somewhere in there. Six one. And that's your theoretical yield. If it doesn't give you an actual yield, then it's not a percent yield question. In order for it to be a percent yield question, you have to know how much the reaction actually made. And then you're gonna compare that to how much you were supposed to be able to make, which is this number. So I left that off. I made this a simpler question, partly so I could write it quickly when I wasn't feeling well. Um, but also not every stoichiometry problem has every piece. You have to think about what's being asked. And if it straight up says you have excess, then it doesn't matter what you're limiting. You already know your limiting reactant, right? So you don't have to use everything. So in this case, platinum metal and excess water doesn't matter how many moles of water you have, it just matters that you're not running out. And if I just tell you it's excess, then you don't need to do any math with limiting reactant. Limiting reactant's platinum, that's it. So in that case, you're just using platinum, you're ignoring the water because you just have enough of it. All right, yeah. Yep, 20, 26, or whatever it is. Yeah, you make the moles of aluminum cancel out with moles and be left in grams of aluminum. So we wind up with 0 
moles of aluminum left. Anytime we want to go from moles of anything to grams, we just use the, the molecular weight, cancel out the moles. One mole of aluminum is 27 grams and whatever it is, give it the one more sig fig, 27.1, 26.9. And so you, then that would give you something like 1.06 grams. All right. So if you can do this problem, you can do any stoichiometry problem. The only way they ever change is if it's not just all in grams. If I give you a concentration instead of grams, then you have to use a concentration to figure out how many moles you have. It can get more tricky if I change how you have to get to moles, but that's just a conversion problem. That's not even a stoichiometry problem. The stoichiometry problem doesn't change. You do conversion to get to moles, then you do moles of compound one compared to compound two. And then put it in wherever units I ask you to put it in. Right? It always, stoichiometry problems are nothing but conversions. If I got really, really tricky, this is actually not a bad idea for gen chem. I could do something like you have a sphere of lead with this diameter. How many, you know, how much product could you make? So you have to do a little bit of geometry first to get to, to get to a volume. And then you could use the density of lead to get to grams of lead. And then we're right back here again. Right? It's just, just a matter of changing how you get to the stoichiometry part is the only thing that makes it any different. Okay. All right, so here's the other way of looking at limiting reactants that I wanted to show you. Um, and I just screen grabbed somebody's uh, quiz because I hadn't seen this written this way before. If you know how many moles you have of both of your reactants, if you divide by the coefficient, what you're really doing, if, I'm, if I show the work more explicitly, say, okay, well, if I have 0 0.1319, and we know that the coefficient when we balanced it was three moles of tin two chloride. We can say basically three moles of tin two chloride is one mole of reaction. We can basically say the reaction can happen this many times. All we're really doing is dividing by that coefficient. If we do that for both of them, they're both, that's, this isn't perfect work being shown because there's no units on it. It's basically moles of reaction. How many times can the reaction happen? once you do this. But if you do that, whichever number is smaller is your limiting reactant. That's how many times the reaction can happen, right? If the reaction can happen 4.4 4 times 10 to the minus 2 times versus you have enough aluminum for 5 and 6.3 times 10 to the minus 2 times, that is telling you the limiting reactants as well. It's just showing the work in a slightly different way. You're basically, by just dividing by that coefficient, you're just saying how many times can the whole reaction happen? And then looking at those numbers compared to each other. And right, so there's nothing wrong with this approach. I would prefer that it had moles of reaction written as a unit, um, just because I don't have numbers without units. But the logic is totally fine. Here. So for those of you who use this or if that helps it make more sense to you, you're totally fine doing this. The problem with this is that it doesn't tell you how much of anything you used or how much product you made. So you still have to turn around and then start and say, okay, well, now that I know my limiting reactant, 
what's my theoretical yield? You still have to do all the same steps either way. But for some people, this might be a better way to think about what's running out first. If that helps the logic make sense. I'm fine with that. And if you are following how to do limiting reactant before that, and this made it more confusing, totally ignore this. Pretend like I didn't show you this. All right, did we get to pH? Okay, so this is one of the reasons, pH is one of the biggest reasons why we talk about excess reactants so much. It's not always just that we care about what's, um, what's left over. Sometimes it's because your excess reactant will tell you um, what the pH is. Is your solution after you mix these things together going to be acidic or basic? You need to know your excess reactant to answer that. So anytime you see a pH question, it's an excess reactant problem. <coughs> So start with your reaction, make sure it's balanced. Acid-base reactions are usually one-to-one. -one. So usually the stoichiometry or the uh, coefficients are really easy to do the balancing, but double check it. If we wanna know the pH, we just have to remember that our pH equation, our definition of pH is negative log. I didn't leave myself enough room there. pH equals negative log of the molarity of H3O plus, which for strong acids and strong acids is all we're gonna be dealing with in this class. Until you get to equilibrium, we're not gonna deal with weak acids. Um, if you have a strong acid, a, the definition of a strong acid is what? Can you talk about that with Carl? Yeah, if it's a strong acid, that means when you put it in water, 100% of it splits up into hydronium, H3O plus, and whatever the, the conjugate base is. So in this case, there's our conjugate base. So when you put perchloric acid in water, and any strong acid in water, it immediately splits up into H3O plus and whatever the conjugate base is. And again, for this class, we're only going to be dealing with acids. We're only going to be doing, doing stoichiometry with acids that are strong acids. So we can assume that this reaction happens 100% of the time. So in other words, if we want to know the pH, we need to know H3O plus concentration. And if we want to know H3O plus concentration, we just need to know the concentration of the acid in molarity, in moles per liter. So before we add the sodium hydroxide, what's the concentration of hydronium? Give you a hint. The number is already written on the page. You don't actually have to do any math. Yeah, it's just your concentration of the acid is your concentration of hydronium. Because for a strong acid, it always splits up and gives the water the H plus. So for a strong acid, whatever your concentration of the acid is your H3O plus concentration. So you're just gonna take that 0 0.0955 and plug it in to get the pH. Before the reaction, so something really close to one, right? 
So if you know the H3O plus concentration, finding pH is really easy. And if you know the acid concentration, you know the concentration of H3O plus for now. If we wanna know the pH after we add the base, sodium hydroxide, we need to figure out how many moles of acid are left over or how many moles of base are left over. So when you have a neutralization reaction, it's always about find concentration of your excess reactants. So any stoichiometry problem, we start by doing what? Put everything in moles, right? And one of these is really easy to put in moles because we just practiced that, right? Getting moles of sodium hydroxide, it's easy as just using the molecular weight. 0 0.395 grams NaOH. Molecular weight of NaOH is really close to 40. Let's see, 40.01 maybe. One oxygen plus one sodium plus one hydrogen. Thirty-nine point So we're going to get something really close to zero point one, a little bit under zero point one. Point zero zero. That makes more sense with the other number. Sorry, point zero zero nine. And give me one more. No, no, no. You get treated to another one of my very special eights. So then nine eight eight. It's your special day. Some reason my snowmen always wind up looking like, or my eights always look like snowmen from Calvin and Hobbes. So that's nothing new. The other, the other one's not anything new either, but we haven't had, don't have as much practice with it. If we want to know how many moles of the perchloric acid we have, we just have to use that concentration that we're given, right? Because what does capital M mean? moles per liter right so as long as we have liters we can use moles per liter as a conversion well we have milliliters but we know how to convert milliliters to liters right
can get 0 0.0 zero zero no point zero one and we're only going to keep one or uh, three sig figs because we have four sig figs in the volume but the concentration is also a measured number and that only has three sig figs. So 0 0.0110. All right. So now, again, remind yourself where we're trying to go. What are we trying to answer here? pH after. So this tells us how many moles we have of both of our reactants. If we want to know the pH after, we need to know the concentration of acid that's left over, the excess. And then we need it in moles per liter. So nice thing about acid-base reactions is that like I said, they're usually one-to-one -one ratios. So that makes it really easy to tell what the limiting reactant is, right? You can show your work, but it's a one-to-one -one conversion for the stoichiometry step. So you don't even really need to plug it into your calculator. You have fewer moles of sodium hydroxide. Therefore, you're gonna have excess for chloric acid. So we have that visible at all? No. If we want to know how many moles of acid are left over, yeah, it's pretty bad. We just do the subtraction. The only time this gets tricky is if you happen to have. There are a few acid base reactions that have a two to one ratio, and then you just have to show the stoichiometry step. So, if we're running out of sodium hydroxide first, we could write it as 0 0.00988 moles of NaOH. And for every one mole of NaOH, one mole of perchloric acid used, All right? So it's just a one-to-one -one ratio, so we can just subtract it. So our moles of acid left over We'll start that we started with minus and we're going to have to round that up anyway, so to leave myself room. So we get 0 0.00 0 or 0 1 1. Is that right? Again, borrowing in your head is hard. Yeah, it's 11.0 .0 minus 9.9. .9. Yeah. So far, that's real straightforward, right? 
now that I've interpreted the problem and we've thought about it in terms of concentration, once we get it to moles, it's not that bad. Last step, and then we'll take our break. If the pH after the reaction, we need not just how many moles of acid are left, we need how many, what the concentration is, which is moles divided by liters. So our concentration of the acid is moles of, of acid divided by volume in liters. What's the volume after the reaction? Thoughts? If you throw a handful of salt into a pot of boiling water, does the volume of the water change? Not measurably, right? Um, and actually in general, when you dissolve something in water, you actually wind up with the, with the volume not changing. It's, you don't add the volume of the solid plus the volume of the liquid. The vol it just stays as the volume of the liquid. There are actually some cases where the volume of the liquid goes down when you add a solute to it. You can take 50 milliliters of pure ethanol and 50 milliliters of pure water. And when you mix them together, you get 98 milliliters because they actually fit together closer than they do when they're separate. So in general, we're not gonna mess with like, well, what's the volume that I added by adding solid? Negligible, ignore it. If we're mixing together two solutions, we just add the volume of the two solutions. But if we're taking a solid and we're putting it into a solution, just assume, assume the volume's the same before and after. So 115 milliliters or 0 0.1150 liters. What do we get? <clears throat> So pH is going to be really close to two now. Two point oh one. All right, so any pH problems at this level are just figure out what's left over. If it's hydroxide that's left over instead of acid, it adds one step. You guys talk about pOH? Does that ring a bell? Okay, maybe very briefly. It adds one step because if you have a concentration of hydroxide left over when you take the negative log of that concentration, you get pOH, but we can always say pH plus pOH equals 14 if you're in water. So it just adds one step where you have, if you get pOH because you add hydroxide as your excess reactant, you still find the concentration of it. You still take the negative log of it. Then you subtract it from 14. And we'll practice that probably on Wednesday. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at 20 after. We'll talk about gases.
Um, it's under assignments. I'm going to put it on there right now. <clears throat> yeah. Do you get points like we turn in the lab after the things do? Yeah, okay. I accept plate work. Okay. There, there is a deduction, but okay. yeah, turn, turn in everything you have. Okay. That's, yeah, I was just trying to get everything. Yeah. And then this one is our last lab. And this is our last lab. So when you take so that's our moles per liter, right? When you take the log of that, she get negative two point oh two. Oh, thanks, sir. Oh, oh. 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 That fix it, Preston. It's not. I'm leaving up there as an example. In some fields and in some countries, log is is what we call natural log. They assume it's log base e. So if you depending on where you type it in, log might not give you the right answer. So if you want to be specific, you say log 10 means log base 10 and that gives you the right answer. In in Europe and in certain fields within math, not math as a whole, but in certain subfields, math log means natural log. So you just have to be careful with that. Thank you. 
Sorry, that's a, an arrow. I was just pointing at the concentration. Oh, sorry. N is a variable, means moles. All right, two quick points of clarification. We're going to use this again here in a minute, but just a reminder you see lowercase n as a variable, that means moles. We're going to use that in terms of gases, gas molecules here in a minute. Um, but anytime you see n as a variable, so it's actually capital N means a, a number of something. So if we actually wanted like molecules instead of moles of molecules, you use capital N. If it's a lowercase n, that means 
in moles. And then the other thing I was gonna clarify is depending on what calculator you're using, where you're plugging it in, not everything will interpret log as log base 10. If you go to Wolfram Alpha, for instance, and type log of 0 0.0096, it gives you a little disclaimer. It says, assuming log is the natural logarithm, natural logarithm, so what we call ln. That's not what we want. So just be, um, you wanna double check. And reminder that, that uh, log base 10 is basically how many decimal points are you from, from zero, right? From the, the decimal point, how many digits are you from the decimal point? So this is really close to 0 0.01, which means our answer should be really close to two because that's two decimal places away. So if you have that in the back of your head, have an idea, okay, here's my concentration. It should be between two and three because my, my concentration is between 0 0.01 and 0 0.001. That'll actually act as a way to make sure you didn't get the wrong log. Um, or if, you have, if you're specifying, you can also just type log 10 instead of just typing log. Log 10 means log base 10. And then you're just being overly specific. In the US, in the sciences, log usually means log base 10, but Wolfram is, is um, based in Europe. And in Europe, log just means natural log. They don't just say LN, they just say log. And if you want log base 10, you have to say log sub 10, right? So just be careful with that. All right. Let's talk about gases, because this is going to be the last way. And basically, the way that this is going to show up on the test um, is this is going to be one more way that you can get to moles from different variables that can be measured. If you have a gas, it's not usually given to you in terms of concentration units, and it's not usually given to you in terms of, of grams. It's given to you in terms of like a volume and a pressure. Um, so with that in mind, what we're, we're going with this is this is going to be one another way we another tool we have of figuring out how many moles of something we have. Right, and so that's going to show up on the practice test. Actually, I'm not sure if I put it on this last year's. Yeah, so sometimes what, it, what I'll do is I will put um, instead of giving a, a volume and a concentration, I'll give you a volume, a pressure, and a temperature. And that's enough to figure out moles. So it's just one more tool in our toolbox to get to moles. That's all. There's more to it than that, but that's, at this point, that's, that's the way we're going to use it. So we have to talk about behavior of gases first. Um, and so it starts, with the, uh, the first of these these what are called the simple gas laws that was discovered was what's called Boyle's law. Um, and Boyle's law applies to, um, if you have a closed system, so think about a, a piston that's closed. So basically a cylinder that's open on one end with a movable height. If you push down on that piston, then some of the, you're changing the volume of that gas. If you change the volume of that gas, other properties are gonna change. So the, the variables that we usually think about for gas, the way we describe gas, I already said this um, term once, is um, in terms of pressure and volume. And pressure is basic, is defined in physics terms as being a pressure, or sorry, a force, spread out over an area. So if you have a certain amount of force and you're pushing on um, an area that gives you a pressure. So this accounts for why it feels different if you push with the same amount of force with, um, you know, if I didn't an open palm slap versus a punch with the same amount of force, punch is going to hurt more because my fist has a smaller surface area than my hand. 
same force, but more pressure. So if a gas pressure is based on these gas molecules flying all over the place, when they, they run into the boundaries, when they run into the edge of the container, what happens? They bounce off, right? So think about these as being dodgeballs. What happens if, if you hit a person with a dodgeball? It bounces off, right? But it exerts some force to do that. So gas pressure is the force of all of the individual atoms, molecules, that are constantly bouncing into the edges of the container, divided by the surface area that they're running into. And don't worry, because we're not actually, this isn't physics class where we're not actually going to do the geometry here and figure out the surface area of a cylinder, because we don't really care what the shape is. We care what the total force is and what the total area is, but we always basically just measure it as pressure. So if we change the volume by pushing down on this piston, what changes out of this equation? Area changes. If we have the same number of gas molecules and they're all moving the same speed as they were before, but now they have a smaller area that they can hit, A goes down. And if A goes down, what would we expect to happen to pressure? Pressure should go up. So we, this is, was actually done as an experiment. They've made a cylinder like this and they tried to make it very low friction. And they just had a way of measuring the volume or measuring the pressure. And they just pushed on it. They measured the pressure. What they found is if you make the volume bigger, pressure goes down. But if you make the small volume smaller, pressure goes up. Kind of makes sense, right? If force is not changing, because we have the same number of gas molecules and they're all moving the same speed before and after, when you increase area, pressure should go down. When you decrease area, pressure should go up. They should be inversely proportional. And it's, it's really easy to see this relationship when you basically just deal in doubles. If you start with 10 liters and you then increase the volume to 20 liters, your pressure drops by a factor of two. You double the volume, pressure's cut in half. You double the volume again, pressure's cut in half again. Is it ever going to get to zero? Why not? Zero is not half. I like that way of phrasing it. Yeah, because you can keep cut. If you keep cutting a real number in half, you keep getting a real number, right? You don't get zero ever. And practically speaking, that also makes sense, right? Because no matter how big you make this container, it still has walls, right? which means there's still some amount of the gas molecules. Maybe it's only one collision every five minutes, but there's still some tiny amount of pressure from those gas molecules hitting the wall, which is why deep space does not have zero pressure. When, you're, when your container is the size of the entire universe, you still have pressure. It's just really, really, really small. Like, like 10 to the 10 to the minus 10 atmospheres, but it's still there, it's still measurable. Did I see a hand up a second ago? Think about going the other way. If we're making this smaller, our area keeps getting smaller, our pressure should keep getting bigger. But again, are we ever going to hit zero volume? Now, no matter what we, we do, we can never actually make it zero volume. If, if for no other reason, the, the gas molecules take up some space. But really, because as we get smaller and smaller and smaller, the pressure goes up exponentially too, right? 
which means you would need an infinite amount of force to push this down to having a volume of zero. Since an infinite amount of force doesn't exist, that never happens. So we have a function that has two asymptotes. Who's taken algebra recently? What function has two asymptotes that look like that looks like this? No, been a bit. Yes, they still call them parent functions. I think that's what I remember them being called when I took algebra. But again, it's been a while for me too. So y equals one over x graph, right? X doubles, y is cut in half. And you have two asymptotes because you can't divide by zero. And no matter how big you make x, y is still not quite zero. So this gives us a function, it gives us a, a formula. And the way it's usually written at first is that pressure times volume for a closed system of gas is equal to a constant. You have a closed system of gas at a constant temperature, the pressure times the volume is always equal to a constant. Or the slightly more mathematical way of writing it is pressure is proportional to one over volume. So this little funny looking alpha is, it means it's not equal to, proportional means that, um, that you have a, that it, at, when you plot these two things against each other, if you plot one over volume versus pressure, it'll make a straight line that goes through the origin. And the result of that is it means we have this, this equation where we can say pressure times volume equals a constant. So even if we're not dealing in nice neat powers of two, that means we can, if you know your initial pressure and volume, and then you change one of those two things, you can find the new pressure and volume. So we'll come back in a second. Um, <clears throat> the way this is put into a more usable form, just saying, okay, well, if some initial concentration of pressure and volume, so P1 times V1 is equal to a constant, and then one of them changes, the product of the pressure of the pressure and the volume is still equal to the same constant you started with. So you wind up, this is the first of these simple gas laws, and it's just pressure one times volume one is equal to pressure two times volume two. No matter what you do, if for a cl closed system of gas, meaning you didn't change the number of gas molecules, that's at the same temperature because the two assumptions that we're making is remember that we started from pressure is equal to force over area, right? And changing the volume just changed the area. So we're assuming that the force is staying constant, which means we're not changing how many molecules we have and we're not changing how fast they're going. We're not changing how fast they're going. What's another way of saying that? What would change how fast these molecules are moving? Temperature. So we're assuming we still have all the same molecules and it's the same temperature before and after. But as long as we can say those two things are true, this equation holds up. Right, and so the way that that gets used is we can do something like anytime, <coughs> excuse me, if we have a pressure, these are just examples of different pressure units. Um, we'll talk about them in a second. It doesn't really matter what the pressure unit is for now. If you have a pressure and a volume and then you change the volume, we can calculate the new pressure. 
we change the pressure, we can calculate the new volume. So if we have a 750 milliliter bottle and it's sealed at 760 torr, it's a unit of, of pressure. We'll talk about where it comes from in a minute. For now, all that matters is the unit of pressure. If the volume see, or expands to 1.65 liters, what happened to the pressure? Qualitatively, it went down, right? We want to know what it is now in terms of a number. We just plug in P1, V1. We plug in everything we know for that equation. So our initial pressure is 760 torr. Again, doesn't matter what that number is. You just need to know it's a pressure for now. Why did I put volume one in liters? We want it to be the same unit as, as the other one. It doesn't matter what the volume unit is, as long as it's the same unit before and after. We can't compare milliliters before to gallons after. We need to compare the same unit. Because mathematically, look what's going to happen. When we plug this in and solve for P2, so we're going to get 760 torr times 0 0.750 liters equals P2 times 1.65 liters. Algebraically, what are the steps we have to do to, to solve this? Divide both sides by 1.65, right? I'll write it the more standard orientation so it's not quite so confusing. If we're solving for P2, divide both sides by 1.65. So what happens to our units then? Cancel. Liters cancels with liters. So we're just left in Tor. So again, it doesn't matter what the units are as long as they're the same before and after. And when we plug this in and get a number, we'll get we a little bit more than doubled it. So we should get something a little bit less than half of 760. And so this is an equation. It allows us to calculate something. Doesn't seem all that useful because how often do we need to actually put a number to pressure? I mean, at this stage, not that much. Um, it's going to be important here in a few minutes. Um, just talk about pressure units real quick. Because we've talked about temperature units, we've talked about volume units. Pressure units can are come in one of two flavors, basically. So remember that pressure is defined as a force over an area. So some pressure units are basically just a force unit divided by an area unit. Pounds per square inch, PSI is pound is a force, square inch is an area. Um, a, the SI unit in physics units for pressure is a Newton per square meter. A Newton's a lot smaller unit of force than a pound, and a square meter is a lot bigger than a square inch. And so you get this 
this number here is in what's called Pascal's um, after Blaise Pascal. Um, and basically all of these numbers are all equal to each other. Which means any combination of these units we can say is a conversion. 14.7 PSI is equal to 101,325 Pascals, right? Any combination of these, because these are all the standard pressure units at sea level. Basically, we just say, okay, at sea level, here's our standard pressure. We're gonna define all these pressure units relative to sea level. And the one that we care about most in chemistry is the easiest one. Atmospheres. At sea level, under standard conditions, the, the air pressure is one atmosphere of pressure. All these other ones are measured numbers that are relative um, to each other. So a Pascal, like I said, the Newton per square meter and 101,000 Pascals is standard sea level pressure. 14.7 pounds per square inch is standard sea level pressure. This Tor unit is kind of a tricky one. Uh, it's named Tor after an Italian, um, I guess you'd call him a physicist probably, um, named Torricelli, who designed the first barometer. He's the first one who figured out how to measure atmospheric pressure. Um, and he found out that if you take a big, a big uh, container full of liquid mercury, if you take a tube that's closed at one end, so basically like a really long test tube, and you submerge it in there so that the, uh, it's totally filled with mercury, there's no bubble in it. If you take that and you then tilt it upright, the mercury will stay in the, in the tube, right? Just like putting your thumb over the top of a straw and pulling it, pulling it up so that the, the soda is above the level of the soda in the container but it stops when the force of gravity on the mercury is equal to the atmospheric pressure pushing down on the surface. So you wind up with a certain height above the surface where it stops rising, where you just get a vacuum above that. That height at sea level under standard conditions is 760 millimeters. So 760 millimeters of mercury is a unit of pressure. Sounds like a length, because it's also a length, but it's also a unit of pressure because that's the height where based on mercury's density, it's equal to the, for the force of gravity on the mercury is equal to the force of the atmosphere pushing down on the surface. Yeah. It has to be at least 760 millimeters. So that's, it does not matter. No, because, because we're dividing by area and and we have a the density of mercury is in grams per cubic centimeter. And then we're going to take that and divide by area. So you're going to get units canceling out and just units left in units of length. A volume divided by an area gives you units of length. If you do this, so it, it really only depends on the density of the liquid. You can do this with water, um, but the problem is water is not as dense as mercury. And so when you do that with water, you wind up with it needing to be. 30 feet tall. Um, and plus water has a pretty high vapor pressure. So you don't actually get a vacuum at the top. You wind up with, so this is supposed to be a vacuum. We're assuming that there's nothing in there that's influencing this, but if it's water, you get actually water vapor in that vacuum. So you don't get as good of a number. Um, but that's why we have these weird units of millimeters of mercury as a pressure unit. We just call that Tor after Torricelli, but people use those two, those two terms interchangeably. Millimeters of mercury and Tor mean the exact same thing. And what really matters the most is that all of these numbers are on your equation sheet and they're all equal to each other. 
So you can convert any pressure unit, any of these pressure units, to any other pressure unit by doing a one-step conversion. All right, if we wanted to say 608 torr, which is about our normal atmospheric pressure up here, and we wanted to convert that into atmospheres, or we wanted to convert that into pascals, we just make ourselves a conversion with these, with these numbers here that, again, are on your conversion sheet under the pressure section. All right. <clears throat> hmm. So once Boyle figured that out, a guy named Charles, and um, it's totally coincidental. I don't think Charles Boyle is named after Boyles and Charles from, from science history, but you never know, I suppose. Um, anybody watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Charles Boyle, it's, I can't teach this section without thinking of uh, Boyle. Um, Charles Law, um, is basically a similar experiment, except he started with a closed container and he kept the pressure constant and he just applied heat to it to change the temperature and he watched what happened to the volume. So what would we expect to happen if you have this, this closed cylinder that can change its volume? What happens when you increase the temperature of those gas molecules? They speed up. And if they speed up, if we're thinking in terms of pressure, that means that we would want, if the force of the molecules is going up, the area also has to go up if the pressure is gonna be staying a constant, right? So we'd expect it to get bigger, which again, makes sense. Think about um, putting a balloon into a car and leaving it on a sunny day. It's gonna expand probably until it pops. And so what we see is, is that that matches. When we increase the temperature, the volume goes up. But the problem is it's not proportional. We have this nice straight line here, but it doesn't go through the origin, which means if we wanted the equation for this line, it would not be a simple equation, right? It would have an intercept, right? And if it has an intercept, that means we can't just use a conversion to get from one to the other. So if we want it to be proportional, we would expect volume to be proportional to temperature, but that's not what we see. So how do we make this look better mathematically? So think about it this way, when we, when we thought about the, um, the extremes in this case, we said, okay, well, no matter what we do to make the volume smaller, we can never get to zero volume. No matter what we do to the volume, we can never make the pressure zero, right? Well, what happens, can we have less than zero Celsius? And there's still, gas still moving around at less than zero Celsius, right? We, we know that we live where it gets below freezing and we don't suddenly not be able to breathe. So there's, but there's should be some point where the molecules all stop moving, right? There should be some point where the volume or the, of this system would go to zero, right? If you extend this backward until you get to the x-intercept, you get a point where you can't get any colder. You can't lower the temperature anymore because the gas molecules can't be moving slower than zero. That's what absolute zero is. This is actually the first experiment where they defined absolute zero and they did it just like this. They got this equation for a line and said, well, if this is a straight line, it continues going negative temperature until you hit a point where the volume goes to zero. And since you can't keep going past that, you can't have a, a negative volume, right? It doesn't even make any sense. Just like you can't be moving slower than zero, 
that's where absolute zero is defined. They said basically just shifted the origin and said, okay, well, well now we're gonna call this zero instead of this. So we just have a new temperature unit. That's where Kelvin comes from. They just said, okay, keep everything the same and shift it over. And you get an equation that looks like this now. And that point where it hits zero is absolute zero. So if we are in Kelvin, we can set up another equation that looks just like our Boyle's law equation. Because we can say, we do a similar derivation. If you start with, okay, volume is proportional to temperature in Kelvin, then we can move things around a little bit and we can still set them up equal to a constant. Volume over temperature equals a constant. And the derivation is not as important as Charles' law, which is for a constant pressure, and a constant number of gas molecules. Volume one divided by temperature one equals volume two divided by temperature two. So that gives us an ability to answer similar questions where if I give you volumes and temperatures, you just solve for the missing piece. You just have to be careful because this only works if temperature is in Kelvin. If temperature is in Celsius, this, this equation doesn't work because there's an intercept in our equation that we didn't take into account. We don't want the intercept, we want it to be proportional. So it has to be Kelvin. All right, we're done with the, done time. And there's one more simple gas law we're gonna go over. And then the one that you actually care about There'll be a couple of slides at the beginning of class on Wednesday, and then we'll finish with review. So work on the practice test between now and then, um, and uh, have any questions ready for me on Wednesday.